This is the Fifth Estate Winning Headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you might have missed this morning. We also take a look at the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 26th of November 2020 and I am Miss K. I'm JM. And I am GK. In case you missed the headlines, here they are. In the Daily Nation, game on. In the Standard, let the people decide. And in the Star, fresh BBI changes, Ryla caught off God. Mm -hmm. So all the papers are talking about uh, the launch of BBI Signature Drive, um, but each paper does various things. Perhaps we start with the Daily Nation. Um, and they say game on, and that there are sweet deals that had been put on the table. And they say a bag of goodies for the political class, yeah. revised proposals on the police and electoral commission, uh, fatter budgetary allocations to the counties, and 20 more constituencies for the Rift Valley. And they're saying that President Kenyatta and uh, Raila Odinga are on a wooing spree for the BBI. But they're asking, is everything hunky-dory in paradise? Um, and I guess that we'll get into that on, <laughs> on why it wouldn't be hunky-dory. Um, but in the meantime, we see that um, there's a creation of an extra 70 constituencies, which is um, interesting, which will increase the number of electoral units from 290 to 360. Um, but we also see the Rift Valley coming out bigly here. We have uh, West Pokot, Nandi, Bomet, Wasingishu each getting uh, a number of constituencies added to them, as well as Kwale. Um, and then we also see that the MCAs, um, on top of the ward development fund that was in the earlier draft, they've been added uh, the fact that they can now be members of the um, executive uh, committee members because before, previously, those were not members of the assembly. Mm. What mm. else has changed, guys? Mm. Mm. So the other thing uh, that is a big deal is the 14 deputy ministers. At least 14 and not more than 22 deputy ministers. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is supposed to, you know, these, these people are obviously going to be supporting the ministers as they go about their, their work. But these are also political positions of stature, of clout, uh, which are also supposed to uh, create this perception of inclusivity. Brilliant idea to go back to this system. But I just, I don't know why they decided deputy minister, not assistant minister. The fact <laughs> no, of the matter is, the we word. will still call them assistant minister. <laughs> <laughs> and not deputy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I think, um, the, the, in, in terms of the big things. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's another, another thing over there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll speak to the issue of all being hunky-dory. And I think the, this is in reference to the fact that the deputy president, William Ruto, was not present at yesterday's mm. event. Yeah. In fact, the standard reference is the fact that he said he was not invited to yesterday's launch of the signature collection. And his spokesperson, Emmanuel Talam, says that Ruto was not invited to the event. If anybody claims to have invited him, let him show you the invitation letter. Isn't there like mm. a state house secular that says... We're going to be having happening. these events in the <laughs> next coming weeks. <laughs> and you should make yourself available. Maybe he needs to reset <laughs> his Zuku or something. Perhaps the <laughs> internet was not, not working. Reach. But on that, I'll say this. Uh -huh. I feel like William Ruto and... Um, Uhuru Kenyatta are like my parents, if I could so speak. Mm -hmm. And I was not present when they decided they're going to hook up. And I should <laughs> also not be present should they decide that there's now a new person yes. in town and they're breaking up. I'll just continue to be a child <laughs> and <laughs> think about the BVI. We yeah. should all continue to be children. <laughs> May I touch a little bit on the star? Uh, turn the blind eye. Yeah. Sure. Now the star is telling us that Ryla was caught off guard. Mm. And here they're making reference to the fact that he spoke about the, uh, amend the, the proposed amendment to have political parties be the ones to select the commissioners of the electoral commission. Yeah. Uh, and uh, obviously in the bill that was published yesterday, that has been expunged altogether. Mm. So status quo prevails yeah. as far as IBC is concerned. And so they were speculating and wondering, was he not briefed on the changes? Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, you know, Raila was making a point uh, and he was making a point regardless of whether it was there or not. Mm. Uh, and a very valid one at that regarding a how if political parties are involved in the selection of commissioners, then the, the contestations thereafter are much lower because you, as the political parties, are the ones who selected the commissioner. Yeah. So you can't come and start telling Kenyans the election was not fair. He failed me. <laughs> yeah, I, so it's actually regrettable that they uh, took that out altogether. Yeah. Uh, I think Kenyans didn't sufficiently understand the, what it meant. The, yeah, what, what that meant, precisely. What it meant. Mm. Yeah. And just lastly, uh, religious leaders also got some concession. Uh, they secured the inclusion of the provision that says, supremacy of the almighty God in shaping the destiny 
of our country. Mm, yeah. uh, so that was interesting. Well, we have a few part criteria that we will use to break down the headlines. We'll ask ourselves, is it topical or speculative? Is it repetitive or groundbreaking? And is it thoughtful or just plain lazy? Um, they're all topical. Yeah. I quite like the Daily Nation because it really so is game on now. Me three. I think Daily Nation is our highest contender. <coughs> there you have it. Daily Nation gives us our one ahead. On to the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country where we also have a three-part criteria. We ask ourselves, is it humorous or dry? Is it satirical or pessimistic? And is it effective or just plain lazy? We only have two cartoons today. Gado, I think... <laughs> drew something quite crazy so perhaps <laughs> <it was laughs> let's do the daily nation and in it we have a caricature of none other than deputy president william ruto and he's in his signature pink pants uh <coughs> on his wheelbarrow and he's on some train tracks and the train that is fast approaching is a bbi train with a reggae scarf up top <coughs> you can't stop the reggae <laughs> train <laughs> yeah. and you know i think even if uh, dp decides to pull a strop not show up to events mm -hmm. things like that bbi is happening it's so happening either you join in and say what your goodies should be yeah, no. or you step out of the way or lay flat and be rolled over there you have <laughs> absolutely. it absolutely and there's no way he was going to be invited to yesterday's event to uh, <laughs> once again you know dampen the mood of the crowd he was going to be booed again he was a party pooper party pooper <laughs> you don't invite party poopers to parties yeah well let's so park it <laughs> <laughs> oh in the man. star, uh, we, we've got the Signature Drive cartoon here, and we've got caricatures of Uhuru and Raila on a luxurious carriage being drawn by Kenyans. Um, and the two are using a pen to dangle the BBI signature uh, form uh, in front of the Kenyans uh, in order to keep it moving. Mm. And the narrative here seems to be that, uh, well, the, the Kenyans here seem very excited. They really do. They seem to have certain hopes and expectations in BBI solving some problems. Mm. And then uh, you've got these guys in the carriage uh, leading the country. It's altogether not a bad cartoon. <laughs> it isn't. And I like the reference to the carrot and stick. But here there's no stick. It's actually the pen, it's which is pen. now mightier than the sword. <laughs> exactly. So I think it's all good. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. And hopefully people take it seriously. I'm glad that they're taking more than the one million signatures. Uh, so yes. that th for the avoidance of doubt, you know, mm. that this, this, this will pass. Who do we give our winning cartoon, guys? Nobody can stop reggae, guys. Yeah? Absolutely. I like that too. Daily Nation gives us our winning cartoon. And now for our final thought. But before we get there, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our final thought today is inspired by The Origins of Totalitarianism, a book by Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt was a German Jewish intellectual who fled Germany in, with the rise of Adolf Hitler in 1933. Mm. She lived in Paris as a stateless refugee and a Zionist activist until 1941, when she then fled to and settled in the United States of America. She first published this book in 1951, and, it de and she derives totalitarianism from three things. Mm. Antisemitism, overseas imperialism with its underpinning of the nation state, mm. and tribal nationalism. Mm. According to Arendt, history has given us only two truly totalitarian states Hitler's German Germany and Stalin's USSR mm. but the conditions that lead to totalitarianism and the tools it deploys are more universal and they can be lead to tyranny anywhere mm. yeah. Arendt explores these conditions in the book's first two sections according to her the racist and expansionist principles of anti-semitism and imperialism were critical in laying the foundations and grounds for totalitarianism we all understand the banality of evil to mm. quote another of her books in anti-semitism but she says that for all its missionary pretenses imperialism inevitably created racial hierarchies to justify the subjugation and even in some instances the elimination of what it considers considered inferior races. The Nazis and the Bolsheviks used the post-First World War breakdown of the nation-state as an opportunity to establish their totalitarian rule. Mm. They used different ideologies towards the same end, total world domination. Mm. Though Stalin instrumentalized Marx, material, uh, material dox, uh, doctrine, Marxism, and Hitler a racist one, anti-Semitism, they relied on common, to common tools. Mm. And terror, Arendt argues, is the essence of totalitarianism. Mm. Propaganda is its adjunct. The true goal mm. of a totalitarian propaganda is not persuasion, but organization. Mm. Totalitarian movements do not merely want to coerce, they aim to instill obedience. They do not actually propagate, but they indoctrinate. Mm. The lies are purposeful and are part of conditioning because the ideal subject of a totalitarian rule is a people who 
for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between true and false no longer exists. Mm. Interest in this book actually saw a resurgence with the election of the Donald, mm. Donald Trump. Mm. Why? Because commentators saw it as a cautionary tale of how US democracy could break down into totalitarian rule. Mm. Commentators referenced the book severally and compared Donald Trump not to a politician but to the leader of a mass <laughs> movement. Yeah. And they made compari comparisons between Trump's self professed mass movement and totalitarianism. Attempts to explain away Trump's idiosyncrasies and quirks were tempered by Aaron's warning that, and I quote, the road to totalitarian domination leads through many intermediate stages for which we find numerous analogies and precedents. Mm. At 752 pages, this was not an easy read, guys. <laughs> yeah, In fact, it had very many detailed footnotes. Yeah. However, with the election of Joe Biden, perhaps it sales on Amazon will go down. Just a little bit. You don't have to uh, worry so much. Absolutely. Speaking of Trump, uh, by the way, he's starting to pardon people. <laughs> uh, just because he knows uh, as soon as December comes and goes, January, he's out of office. Yeah. He's, he'll probably be pardoning himself as well <laughs> in the coming weeks. Um, so, so I'll talk a little bit about the warning signs of totalitarianism and what Hannah says is when people feel excluded, oh lonely, when they feel isolated, left out, uh, when they feel discarded by the communities, and this can uh, be at an individual level or even at a more communal level, uh, at a corporate level, they become a prime target for totalitarian um, uh, recruits mm. uh, or, or, you know, uh, for the totalitarian rhetoric and the message. Mm. Uh, and that's because, she says, when you lose your community, you lose um, your sense of self, you lose your identity, you get hopeless and the like. Uh, and, and so in that desolate and vulnerable state, there's a longing for something else uh, to come along uh, and fill that void and make you feel like you belong once more. And oftentimes in history we've seen that this has been the point at which uh, someone with totalitarian tendencies, people like Mussolini, people like Hitler, swoop in uh, with, with that kind of rhetoric that restores confidence <coughs> um, and, and gives all sorts of promises to restore uh, you know, you to your uh, former glory. Yeah. They come in and uh, people like Donald Trump. They give you <laughs> precisely people like Donald Trump. They give you that message, and uh, and people fall for it. And I'll just give the example of of Hitler, which I think is a classic, classic case. Uh, with and, and Germany after World War One, they were forced to pay huge amounts in reparations. Uh, they were, you know, the economy went into ruins. Uh, they had a serious inflation in the year I think 1923. Uh, their, their, their currency collapsed and then, you know, and while all that is happening, uh, the Allied powers are still taking uh, as, as much from them in terms of resources uh, that, and, you know, making them uh, you know, very desperate. Uh, and then, of course, in 1929, we have the Great Depression and they fall into even more serious economic uh, hardship. Mm. And then Hitler comes in. Uh, in 19, around that time, 1933, he becomes uh, the, the chancellor or uh, prime minister of the country. And, and, and throughout that time, uh, you know, all of Germany was looking for somebody like, like, uh, like Hitler because mm -hmm. in the grandest scheme of things, they had really been isolated in mm -hmm. the world and uh, they'd really been kind of scapegoated even mm -hmm. for all the problems that went, all the, all the things that happened in yeah. World War I. Yeah. And so to stem those feelings of mm -hmm. loneliness, uh, Hannah says we must choose to participate and build more inclusive and less fractured societies, less fractured communities. Yeah. And I think that's the whole point with even the BBI uh, that we're, we're working on here so that people don't feel alienated, uh, alienated isolated um, to uh, have totalitarian uh, leaders in rhetoric. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting and uh, maybe I'll follow on from that with um, one of the things um, her book does was sort of this warning shot to the future of how racism can destroy uh, states and one of the sections is how hatred can go mainstream. Um, so Arendt writes quite compellingly and scornfully about how the elites participate in the erosion of values and the leg legitimization of um, extreme views. And we see Trump and the alternative right did this really well in 2016. Mm. Um, so you have people who belonged um, loosely to this side of the political system. They were essentially excluded from the public discourse and space during Obama's time, mm -hmm. but they didn't disappear. They went into the, net and they cre the internet and they created this huge echo chamber 
um, and where they bounced off these ideas, these ideas became more reinforced. And so by the time Trump is coming and um, running and giving this pan ideology, these people found a home in what Trump was saying and that mm -hmm. became his uh, support base. And Trump did this very well, right? Make America great again, exclusion of others, um, but also saying, I c I'm listening to you. You've been ignored for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. or oh, eight years, but now I'm I here for you. And I can see you. Exactly. And you have, you know, the era of alternative facts. You know, they really just created what they thought was truth um, and ran with it. Um, so the propaganda aspect. Um, and then we have to ask ourselves, is the hustler narrative and the dynasty narrative doing just that? Mm -hmm. um, are, we, are we othering others yeah. <laughs> with this, you know, narrative? Mm. Um, and how dangerous can it be for a state? But the other thing that she says that should be warnings to societies um, begins with things like refugee crises. Uh, so in Origins of Totalitarianism, Arendt argues the fact that human rights become unenforceable when people without a state, usually persecuted minorities, become rightless. Okay. And so she says that only, um, only, you only had human rights if you had a state, which is also now really dangerous. Um, so we need to start thinking about how the refugee crisis is playing out, what it means to the nation state as well, and mm. to these people as you exclude them. And she says that ignoring the rights of others is at risk only to your own. And she says that um, the, for the nation state cannot exist once its principle of equality before the law has broken down. So if you break it for others, you're breaking it for everybody else, and yeah. it can be dangerous. It can come back around to you. Um, and then one of the other things I picked out was that Arendt was one of the first people to draw a line between two major previously disparate um, strands of history. Um, that is the hor horrors of totalitarian regimes in Europe and the brutality of colonial regimes. And we know the latter quite well in this country. Mm -hmm. And she says that imperialism harmed not only their victims, but also the states that perpetrated it. So two new devices for, for political organization and rule over foreign peoples were discovered during the first decades of imperialism. One was uh, race as a principle of the body politic, mm -hmm. and the other bureaucracy as a principle of foreign domination. In summary, she says, imperial, imperialism was the meeting of racism and bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. It sharpened and honed racism into a scientific bu bureaucratic way of running a state. It's really powerful. It's um, really powerful. So I really liked the book. It was a hard read. I can't say I went through everything, but I picked out bits, um, but everyone should. Um, so on a day where we had a winning headline from the Daily Nation and a winning cartoon from the Daily Nation, I want to leave you with Aaron's quote on evil. And she says, if we think of evil as this one person, this one big event, then we want to tend to match it with one big display of resistance. But actually, if evil is banal, a set of ordinary, mundane decisions day by day, uh, then maybe we have to start living differently. We have to start seeing that evil happens quite small, quite undercurrent, um, and the only way to match it is in our daily acts, coming together. And what uh, JM was saying, you know, human dignity coming together, inclusivity. Um, we need a new guarantee that we can live together and have a, a better society. So have a lovely evening. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on TV. On GoTV, Pantheon Air.